God is good? And all the time? I'm Reverend Dr. Paul Marzon, and a special welcome to those watching online and for all those here today. Give yourselves a round of applause. You made it to church today in the snow. You are rugged Minnesotans. I had someone text me. They said, is church still open? I'm like, are you kidding me? I said, I can walk here. I'll preach to myself if I have to. We're, we're going to stay open 24-7. We're here. We're no, no problem. Um, we have a fun message today, and I'm going to put a disqualifier out there. Get out your notebooks or your papers today. I'm putting on my professor hat. Reverend Dr. Paul is going to do a little map teaching today. So everybody... I, so put your name at the top of your, of your worksheet today, and you're going to turn them in at the end of class, and I'll grade them for you, see how well you did, all right? I don't see you with your sheet. I, I, you think I'm kidding. I'm going to stop by the door and collect them on the way out. So I want to make sure you take some really good notes today. Those watching online, you can find them on our Version Bible app, or you can also um, pick them up on our website as well. All right, is there anyone who does not have one that would like one? Just raise your hand. Alan's got extras in the back. Just raise your hand. Just, I know that Bo needs one for a confirmation class, so you're going to be turning that into Pastor Deb. There you go. There you go. All right. If you're new to our church, we have something that's called our cross point, and our cross point's a reminder of, if I get a little distracted today, this is the main thing. The main thing is the main thing. And our cross point for today is God created a sacred space for his sheep. God created a sacred space for his sheep. We're in a series on John chapter 10, talking about the nation of Israel, talking about God creating a sacred space and a place and a people group. And he watches over them, just as Jesus said, he is the great shepherd and he cares for his sheep. First week we talked a lot about how sheep are stupid and that's us, unfortunately. God refers to us as the, the, the ones that are like sheep that have gone astray. And um, Alexander last week had a great conversation talking about the sheepfold. And so God watches over the sheep of Israel has been what we've been talking about. Part of what we're going to talk about today is also about the history of the sacred space called Israel or Palestine. So we're going to have a little bit of history lesson today. That's why I want you to take some notes. We're going to have some maps in a little bit. But it hit me last week when Alexander was preaching about shepherds and sheep. He put up an image of a sheepfold that can... One that would be actually naturally in Israel. And a sheepfold, as he described it last week, and we discussed the first week, is sometimes made out of wood or sticks or brush. Sometimes it's made out of rocks that have been stacked together. And what happened is they take the sheep into this protected area. And it was protected so that if the, the evil forces of the wolves or the coyotes or the lions and bears, whatever came up there, they were to help protect it. And there's one entry point. And that's where the shepherd would lay at night as the gate came. Keeper. He would allow those that needed to be in there, in there, and those that were needed to be excluded, left out. He would literally sleep in that little space in between. So we talked about the last few weeks how Jesus said, I am the gate. I'm both the great shepherd and I'm the one who brings people into that gift of eternal life. Now, we pretty much know this, but the Bible is a book about Israel. And we are a people of the book. So we're going to talk about that today. Sometimes people, when they think about Israel, they think of that's like the far off land that doesn't really have much to do with us Christians. And every now and then I just got to remind people, did you know that we're Jews? Did you know that? <laughs> that we were grafted in when we became believers. So the Hebrew people had this conversation in the book of Romans. They said, well, the Greeks are here, the Jews are here, which are we? And they said, we're both and people. Jesus was a Jew who was born and he preached to the people in Judaism and said there will come another with the power of the Holy Spirit when you will go and share with the world. We'll talk about that a little bit when we get to the book of Jeremiah the prophet who explained how that there would be this people that would bless all of the world. So the Bible's a book about Israel, and we are people of the book. And last Wednesday night, for those that were part of our Wednesday night Bible study, I highly encourage you to come, or you can watch online. Each one is saved on our YouTube channel. We have about 100 people that have been watching online after our Wednesday night classes, about 10 or 12. But about another 100 watch the, the messages during the week. And so it's my son-in-law, James Kaufman, and he does a fantastic job. He spent a year in Jerusalem studying and he talks about, on last Wednesday night, he calls it the land in between. 
Why is Israel called the land in between? It's because it's between all these superpowers of the time. It's between Egypt and Italy or Rome at that time. It's between the Babylonians or the Assyrians and the Egyptians. It's between all the different major trade routes. And the Tigris and Euphrates River were known as the breadbasket of the world. And so that area was often fought over. And so throughout history for the last 4,000 years, you can go to the valley, the Jezreel Valley to this day. There's a place called Megiddo. It's where it's talked about in the book of Revelation, Armageddon, where the last battle will be held, the final battle of all times. And if you go there to this day, you'll still find buried beneath the surface millions of bones. Not thousands, millions. Because of the centuries of battles fought in this open, plain area in the land in between. The Romans would invade from one area, the Egyptians would come to the north, and they'd battle it out in Megiddo. Or the Babylonians would come over and the Assyrians would come over and they'd battle it out. The Germanic tribes from the north would come down south and they would battle it out. And so Megiddo is this valley that's just filled with bones. Ezekiel says that in the end times that those bones in that valley of dry bones will rise again. It's where we get the image of resurrection. Armageddon, Megiddo, resurrection. And this land in between now, this land was given to the Hebrew people. Um, sometimes people think of the Jews as occupiers, but they were actually the indigenous people of the land over 2,600 years before even Islam came into being. So I'm not trying to be political. I'm just going to talk about some history here for a little bit of... Sometimes in the news, they, they talk about things, and we don't always get the history. And as a former history teacher, I want to just kind of talk about how this land came to be, how God gave it to the people of Israel, and then also some of the controversies that we're into today. So first of all, I have map one. So as you're taking notes this morning, you can see map number one. This is Abraham's journey. And if you know the story from Genesis, Abram at the time was his name. He was later called Abraham, just like Sarai was called Sarah later. But Abraham took this journey. And way down in the side of the map, there's a small little two letters called Ur, U-R. And he was called by God to travel. It says, take and walk by faith. And God led him, as you can say, through that fertile crescent along the Tigris-Euphrates River. Up to the north, you see what's called um, Nineveh. You see Haran, which would now be like modern-day Turkey, and then Lebanon is to the south of that. And if you come down, you see that this land in between why it was such a great trade route. You had the Mediterranean Sea on the left. You had the great powers on the right in the Fertile Crescent. You had the powers on the south with the Nile River, the Egyptians. You had the Greeks and the Romans on the Mediterranean Sea. So this land was between all the superpowers. And if you look back in history, as we talked about in our Wednesday night class, whoever controlled this region controlled the world because they controlled the trade. And so this area where Abraham was called to move from, he moved him right by the, the sea, right by the Mediterranean Sea, right in this journey, if you will, of the land in between. The second thing we see in our, our next map is we must see just a little scripture for you. Genesis 15, 18, it says, The Lord made a covenant with Abraham and said to your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river of the Nile, the Euphrates. Now at the time when this was given, there would have been about 300 square miles now, King David did not conquer all of that, but about 200 miles of it he did. And as you can see, it's all the way in the south to the Egyptian border there of the Nile River. And you see it all the way to the north, which would now be modern-day Turkey. And King David, during his reign, and then Solomon for a season after that, controlled this whole region, which would now be modern-day Lebanon, the, the country of Jordan, a big parcel of the Sinai Peninsula, and much of Egypt. This was all controlled by Israel during the time of David. Now, just to kind of put it in perspective, we see the tribes of David, but we also see that in the time of Jesus, the same tribes kind of owned different areas. So we'll pull that up. And you can see this is by tribe. It's a little hard to read. But the bottom tribes were Judah and Benjamin, kind of Jerusalem south. And the other tribes owned other regions. If you look on the far left, it's kind of in red on the bottom of the map. It would be what's known as Gaza to this day often battled by a group called the Philistines. We'll get to that in a second. And then finally, I'll show you kind of modern-day Israel. This is kind of what it looks like today. On the, the top, 
you have the Golan Heights on the upper right-hand side. You have the Sea of Galilee. You have, at this time, a Jesus that was called the Decapolis. It was the Ten City region where he and his father were probably working as carpenters because it was next to Nazareth. As you come south, you see to the Dead Sea. And you see what's that area called Judea, the southern region. Once again, a little more clear, but you can see it's a much smaller area than the time of King David. And that's about the same size it is to this day, except for the, everything on the east bank would be considered part of Jordan. So what's the history? I'll give it to you in a nutshell. It was for about 2,000 years controlled, as we said, by, from Abraham to the time of David to the descendants of the various good kings and bad kings. And eventually there were so many bad kings, there were no good kings left. And he sent prophet after prophet after prophet, including Jeremiah, who we're reading a little bit, and said, you need to repent. And it'd be little seasons of repentance. But mostly Israel never had a good king. Judah had a few. And during this divided kingdom season, God said, I'm going to eventually allow you to be taken over by your enemies for a season, about 70 years. He allowed them to be taken into captivity. And then he returned them to the promised land. But they never really controlled the land after 586 B.C. In 586 B.C., if you remember the story, he allowed Babylon to come in and invade them. And if you remember, we have all those fun stories of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the fiery furnace, and Daniel and the lion's den, when they were all taken into exile. Later, the Persians took over. We have the story of Esther, right? Xerxes, and the things that took place during that era, when the Persians controlled all of that region. Later on, the Greeks came from the north, and they battled in Megiddo, took it over. Xerxes lost many battles, millions of people, many ships, and eventually went bankrupt. So then the Romans came in from the, after the Greeks, and they took it over from the Greeks, and the Romans controlled it for the longest period of time. After then, the Byzantine era came in. As we, Pastor Deb and I were doing pottery in um, Israel, we found a lot of Byzantine pottery. They were very wealthy people, and they conquered much of Israel and kind of did what I would call it, um, made everything very uh, interesting with their pottery because they had brought all their wares from around the world. After the Byzantine period was the Arab-Islamic region era. That would have been after Muhammad came in to power, and they took over much of that region, but then was fought back by the, the Roman Catholic Church. Anybody know the thing that's called the Crusaders? <laughs> so there was back and forth, back and forth for three major different battles in different eras. The Crusaders would win it, and then the, the Turks would come back and fight, and eventually the Mamelukes came in, and the Mamelukes took over as Arabs, and eventually the Ottoman Empire ruled for the longest period of time from Turkey down south. It stayed that way for hundreds of years until there was something called World War I. When World War I came, the British Empire conquered Turkey and took over this land as well as much of Turkey. They gave back Turkey after the war, but they kept control of what we would think of as modern-day Israel. So in 1917, they did something I used to teach in a history class called the Balfour Declaration. Now, just be honest. Raise your hand if you know what the Balfour Declaration is. Alan, thank you. There's somebody else in class paying attention. All right. Carl Rock does. Of course he does. And many of you are probably watching online. But basically, in 1917, they made a declaration saying that because of anti-Semitism around the world, there were lots of pogroms in the 1800s and early 1900s where they destroyed tens of thousands of Jewish people. They burned them alive even. If you go to a place called York in England, you'll see a big pile where there's still a marker to this day where they burned them at the stake, rounded them up, and killed them. And so they said, we need to have a place where they can be protected, or a place where they can go back to in terms of their homelands. So they called it this homeland in 1922, Winston Churchill. Raise your hand if you heard of him. Many of you have, right? He wasn't prime minister yet. He was just working as an ambassador. He controlled that area, so he created a new state, if you will, of Israel in 1922. But it wasn't recognized internationally. In fact, he had a lot of pushback from the other Arab nations around. So he made a compromise. It was called a, a special compromise where they gave the East Bank, which we now think of as the country of Jordan. He said, we don't want to have everybody fighting. So we're going to have the Arabs live on the east side of the River Jordan and the Jews live on the west side. And so that there was a two-state solution. Sound familiar? <laughs> a two-state solution has been fought over ever since. And in fact, in 1948, after World War II, the, the British said, you know, we're tired of, of, of all the fighting that's going on there. We're losing soldiers all the time. We've been controlling this as a police state for 20 years. 
we're just going to give it over to Israel. And the United Nations at that time had a vote and a discussion, and it became its own nation after World War II. And the land of in between, and the land sometimes called Palestine, was then renamed Israel. Whew. I got through it. Everybody got your notes down? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So that's the, that's the short version. I'll give you the long version at class on a Wednesday night sometime if you want to come join us. And everyone wanted to make it their land because it was this valuable trade route. But what really changed the arrow was a guy named Hadrian. Again, if you're a scholar and you remember Hadrian, some of you might know it. He was a Roman emperor. He expanded the Roman government further than anyone else. He went all the way to Scotland. And if you go there to this day, besides the Great Wall of China, there's a wall called Hadrian's Wall. And he built the wall from east to west that now separates England from Scotland. And it's right near the city of York. And so Hadrian was so upset at the Jews and the Christians that in 135 AD, he tried to keep putting down these revolts. He finally said, I've had enough of you people. And he made their religion illegal. And then he also said, I'm going to rename the area where you live. And at that time, he called it Palestina. Palestina in Latin, which is in the Hebrew word for Philistines. Sound familiar? He knew how much the Jews hated the Philistines, and the Philistines and the Jews fought for years in that Gaza Strip area. So he said, I'm going to just give it all to the Philistines and call it Philistia and make them the new kings of the area, and we'll watch over them. And from that day forward, it was often called Palestine after Hadrian renamed it. It had Jews in it, it had Arabs in it, it had Christians and Muslims, but that was the era it was called. So why are we talking about it today? Another scripture passage for you. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 12. It's a reminder that we are grafted in to this covenant community called the Hebrews. In Genesis 12, 3, it says, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And then all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This was the covenantal promise given to Abraham and through the covenant promise later the Messiah who blesses each and every one of us. But there's also the warning there, whoever curses you, I will curse, and whoever blesses you, I will bless. Let's get to our second point then. So why are we talking about the curse and the blessing? Because it's... We had a discussion the first week, and as Alexander talked about last week, there's something called the evil one. This one that's called the, the false voices that we talked about in John 10, 10. And we need to beware of the false shepherds and the false voices. It says in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. And I've come that they may have life, and they may have it to the full. As Alexander said, it's that word abundant life. And as I described it, it's a, that sense that when we have a sense of harmony with God and harmony with one another. But the problem is that this region for many years has not had much harmony. And most recently, we've seen a huge tragedy over the last months. The good news is there's a temporary ceasefire. The good news is there's people being traded back and forth. We'll see how that goes. But there's a group that now is a, the modern-day Philistines, if you want to use that terminology, and it's called Hamas. I haven't said much about this the last few weeks because we've been in so many different sermon series, but since we have kind of a standalone week and then Advent starts next week, I thought I'd just kind of give some information about some contemporary things going on. People have been emailing me and asking me questions, and I said, I don't want to get political, I just want to get historical, okay? And if we go back to the history of Hamas, it's described as a organization, a terrorist organization, made up of Sunni Muslims. Now there's two denominations, there's actually 70 denominations in the Muslim community, but two main ones, if you want to think of the Catholics and Protestants, they have the Sunni and the Shiites. The, the, the Shiites uh, tend to be what we think of as um, ones who are more traditional. Oftentimes they blend in with the cultures of which they are around. Many uh, are uh, Shiite Muslims here in the United States. And the Sunni um, are ones that are probably a little bit more, if we use the term, on the radical side. They have more of a feeling of geographic conquest as well as a spiritual conquest. And so the term Hamas comes from the Arabic word for zeal or strength. Zeal or strength. It's also an acrostic for the 
Palestinian Liberation Organization, if you will, that they took on that, that region in that name. Now, interesting enough, it's also a word in Hebrew. It's spelled a little differently, C-H-A-M-M-A-S, but it's the word for violence. Violence. And so there's this sense that it is zeal or violence, or maybe some of both. Now, Hamas developed their first covenant in 1988, and in that covenant, they said that Israel will exist and will continue to exist until Islam can obliterate it. And so they purposely moved in as an organization with their full intention to obliterate modern-day Judaism. In their chartering documents, they said the day of judgment will not come until Muslims fight and kill the Jews. So this isn't any kind of hyperbole. This isn't any kind of sense of um, rumor of who they are, what they are. This is their founding documents. And it says Hamas will do whatever it takes to kill the Jews and this is the saddest, including killing other Palestinians. On the 1,500 people who were killed a little over a month ago, when they went into that concert, they were not discriminating against Christians, Jews, or Palestinian Arabs. Anybody who was there was killed. And they killed a lot of their own countrymen who just happened to be there for a concert. And the way they hid out afterwards in hospitals and in schools has used human shields. And so many were killed in the back and forth. In 1987, Hamas was founded by Sheikh Ahmed Yassin. He was a Palestinian cleric, if you don't know or haven't heard of him. And I think one of the best ways that we kind of see this unfolding is this hatred, and as I would say from the scripture standpoint, voices that are not of the great shepherd. And so you might ask the question, what's, what's the rationale? Why, why so much hatred? Why is Hamas intent on in wiping out the Jewish people? It goes back to a battle, back to the discussion we had when we started the sermon. Abraham. Again, if we know our biblical history, Abraham was sent out to start this new land with a new people. He had his wife Sarah with him. And at the 90 years of age, he said, you're going to have more children. And Sarah laughed, remember? <laughs> I'm too old to have kids. And she really believed that, so she had her handmaiden sleep with her husband, Abraham. And they had a child named Ishmael. But then after that, a jealousy ensued, so Sarah said that she, Hagar and Ishmael would have to leave. And so they were no longer allowed to stay with Abraham and the rest of the family, even though he fathered the children. And so Sarah eventually did have a son named Isaac. Isaac is the father of the nation of the Jews, Ishmael, the father of the nation of the Arabs. And ever since then, there's been this contention between the two. So someone asked me, well, what is this contention? What is anti-Semitism? So I answered it as best as I could. I look at anti-Semitism as another word for Satanism. I go back to Revelation 12.4. The evil one, called the dragon in this particular translation says the dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. Satan knew that the deliverer of all people would come through the Jews, the Messiah, the ones we'll be celebrating and talking about the next four weeks. And so he was dead set against the Jews having the Messiah be born. And so for centuries he fought against the Jews any way he could. And the evil one was a deceiver. And the evil one still is a deceiver. And any time we say that a people group, regardless of who they are, is to be wiped out, that's the term we use as discrimination or prejudice, which God does not love. God loves all peoples. Amen? And so there's this contention of some people still through the power of Satan's lies trying to wipe out Jews around the world. We can see it in some campuses right now. We're seeing it in some parts of the world right now. And so we have to do what Jesus said to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm going to just share just one image just to put a face to some of the things that are happening overseas. And this is during the first day of the war. This is Hadar and Atai Bertachevsky. And maybe you saw their story in the news. They're a young family. They lived right on the border of Gaza. And they were 
enjoying time in their home when suddenly people came over in bicycles and hang gliders and a variety of ways they invaded the area where they were living. They had these two young little twins and they knew that um, their lives might be at risk so they had a safe room in the house where they put them and locked them up. And then like most Jews, most of the Hebrew people in the nation of Israel, Arabs, Muslims, Christians, they're all trained to fight as part of the standing army. So they too had guns and they went out in the street and did their best to defend their home. But they lost their lives and they died in the battle. The good news is 14 hours later, the Israeli army came in and found those two little babies still alive and have now been adopted. But that's kind of the face of this war. People at home, people not expecting to be battling in the middle of the night. And the battle's been going back and forth for over a month. And so we praise God that there's a ceasefire and perhaps more things can be negotiated. So why am I sharing this again? Because I want to share the good news. The bad news is there are evil voices, there is discrimination preached and taught, but the good news is we have a great shepherd, and the great shepherd wants to bring all into peace with himself. Again, the great shepherd will be returning as we say in John 10. The reason my father loves me is that I laid down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. And I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. And this command I received from my Father. You see, Jesus sacrificed his life. And through his blood on the cross and through his body being broken, he laid down his life so that we could be of one. We'll be taking communion at the end of the service again today as a reminder that Jesus died for you and for me. He died for us all. He came into this world, even though Satan was against him, even though Herod tried to kill him and killed all the babies to and under in the nation at that time near Bethlehem. He escaped into Egypt. He grew up as a young man. He taught as a rabbi and later sacrificed his life on the cross. And as he said, it was his choice. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. So the good news is that Jesus Christ died for you and for me. And as we say in our communion liturgy in a little bit, we say that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Now this was prophesied in Ezekiel chapter 34. So I'm going to turn to that at this time. It says, For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. And as a shepherd looks for his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they are scattered on a day of clouds and a day of darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and I will gather them from their countries. I will bring them out into their own settlements in the land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel and the ravines and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend to them in good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. They will lie down in good grazing land and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. So what's happening is Ezekiel saying that in the end days, I'll return all those to the land again. I'll bring them from the scattered nations where they have followed other voices, other bad shepherds, and try to bring them home. And then the very end of Ezekiel 34, he says, I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak. The sleek and strong I will destroy, and I will shepherd the flock with justice. Some of you know, um, if you've been around Crossroads long enough, that I grew up as a shepherd, or got to raise sheep with my brother Mark. I think he's in the room here. My dad was a sheep farmer, he used to take sheep to the state fair. But one of the things I know that my dad taught me was how to bind up the injured, and how to care for the least, and the lost, and the left behind. I remember one time when one got out of the fence and it got torn up by the, the barbed wire and was ripped up on the inside and on the bottom of its stomach. And we carried it back into the pasture. And I remember it was bleeding as we're pouring the iodine on it and, and trying to patch it up. But I also remember my dad just caressing it like it was one of his own kids. And he held it, 
and he stroked it and he said, it's going to be okay. My dad had a shepherd's heart. And what I learned from that is that's our Lord and Father, the great shepherd. We go through woundedness. It saddens him. When we fight, it saddens him when we can't have unity. But he never gives up on us. And I think that's why he wants us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. It says with Jesus and Abraham both had the same comment. God will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel. Please pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So we pray for that today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your historic understanding of your word. We thank you, Lord, for this land in between that you gave to Abraham so that there could be a, a chosen people that could lead others to know you. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to the nation of Israel so that when he died upon the cross, each of us could be set free. Lord, in these complicated times, help us to understand more fully your purpose for the people of Israel. Help us to understand how we can best, as the people called the followers of Jesus, be grafted in during this time. Not to excuse murder, not to excuse killing, but to pray for peace and to enter in, in such a way that we too can make a difference. As you sent your son, he said, they'll know they're Christians by their love. Help us to live that example, Lord. Help us to demonstrate what it means to love in a hurting world. We pray for all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our prayer partners to come forward. And if you feel on your heart an opportunity, we'd like to provide an opportunity for you to come and pray any prayer requests that you have. As I was backstage, as a matter of fact, I got a prayer request from one of our own. Uh, young family, four small children. Dad's a firefighter and EMT, just had a stroke. They're rushing him to the hospital. So we want to keep, um, keep that family in our prayers. And others, this is a time for you to write those prayers down. The um, ushers can collect those in a little bit after the service, or if you want to come and pray with one of the prayer partners, please do so. This is your time to respond to what you've heard here today. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you feel the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will feel me. The Spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water. Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. Fire and wind come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come and rest on us. Come and rest on us. Fire and wind, come and do it again. Open up the gates, let heaven on in. Come and rest on us. Come and rest on us. And come down. Spirit, when you move, you make my heart down. When you 
When you feel the room, you're here.